All right, we are finishing up uh, the, we're going to do the questions on Melchizedek. Uh, we almost finished Melchizedek last week, and then we're going to get into our study on Ruth. Uh, so we finished reading in Hebrews uh, last week, and as we ended, uh, we, of course, as we, as we started the discussion on Melchizedek, we talked about how there are some who say Melchizedek was immortal or that he was actually Jesus on earth before he ever was born and so forth. Our first question, do you think Melchizedek was immortal or was taken by the Lord so that he would not see death? Some people have said that. Why or why not? What do, you, what do you think the text means when the Hebrew writer refers in chapter 7 to the fact that he was without mother, without father, without end of days, and so forth? Not recorded for us. Okay, it was not recorded. Yeah, it was not recorded. And it wasn't recorded for a reason. It wasn't recorded for a, ver for a very specific reason, as the Hebrew writer talks about the fact that the, the record in Genesis of Melchizedek receiving tithes from Abraham, that is the witness that Melchizedek lived. That, that's the only mention of Melchizedek in the Old Testament. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent with what we know from the rest of Old and New Testament uh, to think anything else about Melchizedek other than the fact uh, that it simply isn't recorded for us. And that is kind of part of the point that the Hebrew writer makes. Question two, why do you suppose we have so little recorded about this man when he seems so very important? I mean, three verses in the book of Genesis. We've got the one prophecy in Psalm 110, and then you've got Hebrews 7. Okay, well, there, yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff that we don't have record of regarding the patriarchal law, the law that existed before the law of Moses. But we know that Melchizedek was a priest, which meant that there was a priesthood. Obviously, there were sacrifices that were involved. We know that going back to Cain and Abel. So the fact that those things aren't recorded for us, not only is it not recorded for a reason, but the fact that Melchizedek was a priest, and what else was he? King. Yeah, he was priest and king, a concept that was completely foreign under the Old Testament. Because of what tribe only could serve in the tabernacle? Levi. Levi. The sons of Aaron. They were the only ones who could serve at the tabernacle. And so a king and priest both at the same time seems, uh, I mean, that would be a foreign concept under the old law to the Jews. But the fact that Jesus came, and he was a king, obviously, but of a spiritual kingdom, but the fact that he now is king and high priest is part of the parallel that the Hebrew writer draws between Melchizedek and Jesus. Question three, what implications do we find by the fact that Melchizedek is described as a priest of the Most High God? It's easy to lose sight studying the Bible that it's following the story of usually one particular people, mm -hmm. one nation or things about them, but the rest of the world still was going on, and God was concerned and dealt with them. Mm -hmm. So here's a tiny insight. And, and it just goes to show that man has always had law from God, right? Okay, even when people have gone away from that and have chosen to forget about Jehovah, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 1, they chose not to remember God, not to retain God in their knowledge, is how the King James words that, uh, they, they decided to do their own thing. But that doesn't mean that God didn't give them law to start with. From Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, all the way through Noah and his family, and then all the way through Abraham and his family, all the way up to Moses, there was law. Even, even though people for, chose to forget, some of them, many of them, uh, there was still law. Okay, that, that patriarchal law is what we call it, even though... You know, it doesn't have that name to it, uh, but that law that they had. And this is what that helps us to understand and helps us to, to know is that there was a priesthood that existed before the old law did. There was a, uh, obviously there were 
rules and commandments just as there were in the Old Testament and as there are now in the New Testament. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commandments. Not, no, not just my guidelines, not just my suggestions or my advice, my commandments. Okay, and so the fact that there were obviously commandments and, and rules to follow, there has always been such. God has certain expectations or standard of right and wrong and has always been so. And so that helps us to understand that. Last question, what qualities should we or can we emulate from Melchizedek, about whom we only have three verses in the Old Testament, or well, in Genesis, then the prophecy, and then chapter 7? What can we possibly know about Melchizedek that we could take to ourselves? He offers gifts and kindnesses to Abraham. Okay. Even though Abraham said, no, I'm not taking them for these guys. Okay. And then flip that, as Abraham pays him tithes, no indication he sees it as being about him, he's still priest of God, serving God. Okay. All right. Joe? Uh, there in Hebrews 7, he's the king of righteousness, so that it speaks to his character somewhat, I would think, and then it's also in the same verse, king of peace. So that was an ideology that what he was pursuing. Right. I think you, you learn from the fact that not only as king and the fact that his name meant uh, what it meant as king of righteousness, uh, but also recognizing that his uh, role as priest of God speaks a lot to his, first of all, his faith in Jehovah. Okay. A lot of times we think it was only Abraham during the days of Abraham. But Abraham and his family were the only ones who were faithful to God. But what Genesis shows us is that that's not true. There were others. It wasn't just Abraham. There were others like Melchizedek who were faithful to God as well. It, it shows, and again, I don't know what standards were in place for the priesthood un, under that law. I don't know what all was involved, if it was a, of a lineage type thing like it is under the old law. I don't know. But what we do know is that he did focus on his service to God. He served as king based on the fact that the adjectives describing as king of peace and king of righteousness, I would suggest that he was probably a good king over the city of Salem or Jerusalem. He was king of Salem. The fact that we also know that Melchizedek going forward, the fact that this man, uh, especially when you read the dialogue between Abraham and Melchizedek. Melchizedek references God Most High. And then Abraham turns right around and uses that same language with the king of Sodom. Okay, the very same language that Melchizedek uses in praising Jehovah, calling him God Most High, Abraham uses the same phrase with the king of Sodom. I think that's interesting. So yeah, I think there are qualities there, even though we have really no real insight into this man. There's enough there to know that he was a faithful servant of God. He was a priest of the God Most High. And relaying that into the New Testament, what does Peter tell us we are? We are a royal, or we are a, a holy nation and a what? A royal priesthood. Royal speaks to what? What does royalty or royal speaks to? Okay, it speaks to that authority of kingship, of authority, and then the fact that there's a priesthood, that all, though, all who are Christians, being heirs of Christ, are part of the same qualities of Christ. Christ is both king and high priest as such. We are of, of his family. We are royalty under that concept, under that spiritual idea of, of being having that glory, that that. Uh, that grace, I guess you could say, and then also the fact of that we are serving in the tabernacle of the Lord, okay, even though it's not, not in heaven yet, we come to God in the, in the holy, holy in prayer, we uh, serve God in him, we pray, we uh, take the Lord's Supper, we do those things that God tells us to do as the priesthood did under the patriarchal law and the mosaical law. So I think there's there's some interesting things there about about Melchizedek. Anything else about him? 
All right, let's move on to Ruth. Ruth has her own book. We're going to start with Ruth chapter 1, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ruth and her, a little bit of her background also. And in dealing with Ruth, it's interesting because what makes Ruth, of, uh, aside from the fact that she has her own book, what else makes her of a, a key uh, figure in the Old Testament? What else about her is important? She's of the lineage of Christ. And why is that particularly important given her background? She wasn't born a Jew, was she? Okay, she was a Gentile. And the fact that Ruth is specifically mentioned uh, in the lineage of Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 1 and in verse 5, which we'll look at in just a minute, I think is, is very, very important. It's very telling. But she's a Moabite. And, of course, we talked about Lot and how, unfortunately, but also according to what God knew was going to happen, both the Ammonites and the Moabites came from Lot, uh, interestingly enough. She lived in the days of the judges. We see this mentioned here in verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, she's living in, in and around the, the 1100, 1050 B.C. or so, uh, about that time. To kind of give you an idea, idea, Jephthah died around 1095 B.C., Saul was made king in 1050 B.C. So this is toward the end of uh, the work of the judges and before uh, Saul is made king. Uh, we see how that, going to Matthew chapter 1, in this lineage of Jesus, and of course it starts going with Abraham, verse 2, all the way down to verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed, by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot David the king. Isn't it interesting that back to back you have women being mentioned who were not born as Jews. You've got Ruth, who's a Moabite, and then Rahab was from where? Jericho. Okay, so you have these two women who weren't of Jewish descent who were key components, not just in the lineage of Jesus, but in the lineage of what other important Old Testament figure? David. Now, that, that's something that at the time the Jews didn't really want to dwell on too much about the Gentiles being a part of that, but Rahab and Ruth were both key components uh, of the lineage of Jesus. All right, so going back to Ruth, chapter 1, uh, we start here in verse 1. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Shelion. Uh, Ephrathites, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So the first five verses really are primarily about whom? What's the writer of Ruth focusing on the first five verses? It's not really about Ruth. Who's it about? Naomi. <laughs> it's kind of looking at this from Naomi's struggle. Her husband dies. Then her two sons, after they are married, they die. It doesn't tell us how or why, if there was a... Uh, if it was violence or, or what, we do know that there was famine, which is why they moved, but we don't know much else other than that. So in verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab uh, that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So, as Naomi's prepared to go home, 
She, she speaks to these two Moabite women, and what does she tell them to do? I'm heading back home. What does she tell them? You go back to your father's house. Okay, there's no reason for you to go with me to go to a land that isn't your own. You're from Moab. You are Moabites. Just, just go home. You have no, uh, there, there's no obligation to, to me. You have taken care of, of my sons while they were alive. Uh, each go to their father. Go to your father's house. Go home. Now, we see in verse 9, in the end of verse 9, So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, not necessarily that she's blaming God for the things that have happened to her husband and her sons, but the fact is God did allow it. And she's taking this as, you know, as the hand of the Lord being against her. Now, that being the case, what else is she implying by sending her daughters back to their homes? What can they then do? They can remarry. Yeah, they can remarry. You can have a, a life, a family. You can have children. Go home and remarry. There's no reason for you to go with me. I, there's, there's nothing for you there. Now, obviously, in these first... 13 verses, what do we see that's pretty obvious between Naomi and Orpah and Ruth? Sorry? They were close, yeah. Seems like there's a very close-knit family going on. Okay, they, were, they, 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 lived, they all loved each other. In fact, she even refers to them as her what? Her daughters. Yeah. And the fact that they're so close, they kind of view each other as family. The fact that they were so emotional over this, they were weeping. Uh, that, that shows kind of the, the love that they all had for one another. And that's going to be a very important point of this going forward. Verse 14, they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So you read in verse 15 or verse 14 the fact that Orpah kissed her mother in law. It's implied that she kissed her, and what did she do? She went home. Okay, in verse 15, that's exactly what Naomi tells Ruth. Your sister in law's, she went home. You need to also. But it says that Ruth clung to her, as in what? I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going with you. Now, I don't know what, you know what her family life was like, what her parents or whatnot. I don't know. But do you really think that's what the issue is? I don't want to go home. You think that's what the problem was? Well, by by the, the, the words that she's saying here to, from Ruth to Naomi, what picture do you get? She's devoted to her. I am going to be with you all the way. And where you die, I will die. She even goes on to say, your God will be my God. And then notice, and of course, Naomi even talked about the gods of the Moabites, the false gods, or but she went ahead and went back. But Naomi, or uh, uh, Ruth, she's willing to give everything up, her past, her family, everything, to go to a, a land that is completely foreign to her, all because of her devotion to Naomi. Anything through verse 17? Yes, sir. You know, great sounding statement. Your God will be my God. 
I'm, at this point, I don't know if she's taken that on because of faith in the Lord. Because, you know, when you go back and just review this, this family, there's a famine. Mm -hmm. They're not the first one, but famine. They didn't trust God to stay there. I mean, we up and down that. I mean, it just doesn't speak to them having a great influence. Maybe they did influence mm -hmm. her to believe in Jehovah, and that's part of her decision. To me, it seems more like she's just, like I said, devoted to her, whatever yeah. you're about, Naomi. Yeah. And care for her because some years they've been caring for their mother in law. Right. You know, I'm going to stick with you. And I think that that's an important point that, that as we see the story of Ruth go forward, we're going to see more and more, certainly her devotion to Naomi, but we'll also start to see her faith in Jehovah as well. Okay, again, whether or not, obviously being a part of that family, I'm sure they had learned about Jehovah and whatnot, but you know, like Nolan says, it's, it's very possible that in saying this, listen, whatever I need to do, I'll do because of my devotion to you. And so that might be the primary motivation right now. But then going forward, it's interesting because we're going to see how Ruth, it seems gradually, this is one of those things as she learns more and more, she comes to understand Jehovah and that faith to Jehovah grows. Anything else through verse 17? Yes, sir. Back in verse 8, I don't know, she tells them to go return each to her mother's house. And I don't know if that's an indication that, that the fathers have passed away. But we certainly see that she thinks of Naomi as much, if not more so, as her mother. Yeah. Than going back to be with her mother. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be. It could be that the fathers had also died. Uh, so each go back to your mother's house. Or it could be that she's simply emphasizing uh, the relationship that existed between her and these two ladies. Now, you need to go back and have it with your, your blood mothers, your, your real mothers, not just your mother-in-law. Uh, you know, where regardless, she's emphasizing going back to their homes. Uh, and, and it may be that her, their fathers were dead. Maybe they were of age and had passed away or whatnot. Uh, anything else through verse 17? All right, verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Does this mean Naomi had lost her faith in Jehovah? She's observing, I mean, she's observed this, and, and, and granted, imagine the emotional turmoil that she has gone through. She's lost her husband and her two sons. She had to part ways with one of her daughters-in-law. Okay, there's a lot of emotional turmoil there, but is it, has she lost her faith in Jehovah? What does she call him? Almighty. I wouldn't say she's lost her faith in Jehovah, but she thinks that God's angry with her. She thinks that God has allowed this to happen for a reason that has something to do with maybe I've upset him, he's, he's, uh, has afflicted me. So it's not necessarily that she's mad at God or that she has lost her faith in God. It simply sounds as though as if God has turned his back on me. You know, he's almighty, but he, whatever I've done, whatever the situation is, this has happened to me. God has allowed it to happen to her. But, and she even goes as far as to say the Lord has afflicted me or the almighty has afflicted me. Uh, but, but she's very upset. But she hasn't lost her faith in Jehovah. No. Agreed. And it's a common thing. We are like this sometimes, I suppose. If things are going good, God is favored with us. If times are bad, we've done something wrong. In verse 6, the statement is, she heard the 
that the Lord has visited his people giving them bread. Can you read any more into that? A specific blessing other than just the cycles of harvest and good and bad? And I, I think the, the fact of the matter was that they were blessed with bread, whether it was because the people had turned back in the midst of the cycles of the judges. Things would be good for a while. Of course, we know how the cycles of the judges work. Things were good for a while, and then who would die? The judge would die, and then what would the people do? Then they'd turn away for a while. Uh, I, I, the, the idea that of God blessing his people, obviously she got word via messenger or just through kind of travelers passing by that in the moment, or for the moment, Israel was doing well. Okay, that for whatever, so whatever, however it came about, God had blessed them with food. So I, I don't know that you could read necessarily anything specific, anything miraculous necessarily into it, other than the fact that maybe this is one of those moments where they were uh, being, they had been delivered by a judge, and now they were following and doing what God wanted them to do, and God blessed them. The point is, yeah, we don't, we don't know specific, right. but the point being contrast to the God has punished me or done me, she still believed he, he's blessing he's, he's doing positive things. He hasn't blessed me, but he's blessed my people. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, God has been with my people, he just, he, he hasn't been with me, he's afflicted me. Yeah. Anything else through verse 21? And of course, keep in mind, one of the common thoughts, remember going back to Job, what was the mistaken thought that Job's friends had? If, if something bad happens to you, it's because you've done something wrong. You've, you've committed sin. And Job says, I haven't done anything wrong. And Job maintained that consistently. And, of course, it's a mistaken or, or a, a, a common false thought that if something bad happens, it's because God is mad and I've done something wrong. And it's not necessarily that it was, it was just in Job's time. But as Nola noted, even into today, people still have those types of thoughts. Does it necessarily mean God is mad at me if something bad happens? James tells us in James chapter 1 to count it all joy when you fall into various what? Trials <coughs> or tribulations. Okay, it doesn't mean God's mad at you, but what's the opportunity there? Well, to grow. To grow to show our faith in Jehovah, understand that he has blessed us, and even though maybe in this moment we're struggling, that doesn't mean that God hasn't blessed us and still continues to do so. Paul says, whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. I recognize God has taken care of me even when I'm hungry, even when I suffer need. Philippians chapter 4. It just strikes me, even the Lord has greatly afflicted me. Sometimes we don't see Maybe he, he was part of taking them to Moab so they could survive and live. And they had food. And she had a husband. She had two sons. She picked up two daughters. And there's been a number of positive things sure. also. But she seemed to be centered around, I went out full, came back empty. Yep. The loss of the, the husband and the son, which is certainly huge sure. blows. Sure. Now, isn't it interesting, though? For us, looking back in hindsight, if there was no other reason for Naomi and her family to go to Moab, what do we know ultimately did come, from, uh, come about from it? Huh? What's that? Yeah, Ruth. Ruth came, and ultimately Ruth helped produce David, who ultimately produced Jesus. And so that fact alone, it kind of helps us in perspective to see how Naomi, and in the moment, okay, in the moment of great distress and emotional turmoil, a lot of times we have blinders on. A lot of times all we can really see is our problems and our issues. But what's great about us being able to look at this from bird's eye view is the fact that sometimes in the moment we don't realize that there is a greater purpose, a greater plan that God has. And obviously part of that plan included Ruth coming to Judah. That wasn't going to happen. I mean, God could have made it happen a different way, but that wasn't going to happen necessarily unless Ruth or uh, Naomi was there. And all of this, her husband died, her sons died. That's what prompted Naomi's return. That's ultimately what ends up being the avenue by which Ruth comes to Judah. So obviously, the, 
the providence of God. A lot of times we use providence in a positive light, in the sense of, of blessings or good things. In this case, you could, I mean, it's still providence, but it may be negative in the moment because Naomi lost her uh, husband and two sons. It's still providence of God because it worked out to bring about God's plan. Doesn't mean that God was mad at Naomi, but she feels that way. Any other thoughts? Oh, yeah. Oh, all the terrible. I mean, what a roller coaster Joseph had in his life. You know, I mean, going from good to bad to good to bad, and the extremes that he went through. And yet, through it all, though, what did Joseph acknowledge? God's with me. Yeah, he's working it for good. May not necessarily specifically for my good, but he's work, it's, all, it's bringing about good. And ultimately, of course, we know it brought about good for Joseph's family. Gave him a place to come to get food in Egypt and so forth. All right, verse 22. Say, it helped Egypt also. Say what? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it gave Egypt the means of, of seven years of plenty to be able to store up for the seven years of famine. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. It's interesting. I don't know if there were people coming on ahead that were saying, hey, Naomi's coming home. Obviously, she's returning back home where people know her. Um, but she says, call me Mara. And Mara literally means bitter. Uh, and that's why she says, Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She's coming back without anything. And of course, keep in mind, there's a little bit of a social element to this as well. Because without husband and without sons, what kind of, where does that, where does that put her in the social links of things? That's bottom. She has to rely on everyone else. In that society, without a husband or sons to take care of her, she's going to have to rely on the goodness of others to take care of her. And, I mean, that, that, I can, you know, again, from a, a social perspective, from a, a I have no means of taking care of myself perspective, obviously a lot of that is weighing on her as well. All right, anything else through chapter 1? All right, going into chapter 2. So um, what we see in chapter 2, she, we find that she meets Boaz here. And we're, we're not going to read all of chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, but I do want to point out some highlights of some of these because obviously all of this is leading to a, a point. Uh, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. Okay. She wants to, to basically get noticed by Boaz, is kind of the idea that I get from that. Verse 3, Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, we're not told exactly what the relation was, whether he was a cousin, uh, an uncle, or whatever. We don't know what the relation was specifically to Elimelech. But, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Which apparently was kind of a common greeting okay, amongst people at that time. It's not necessarily like this is a one-time thing. This was something that was commonly said. Verse 5, Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And so the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Now, why, was, why do you think Ruth is out there collecting after the reapers? Why was she out there? Okay, and what were the leftovers designed for? The poor. The poor. And where's Naomi in this social structure? Poorest. She's poorest. Okay, so she's really, Ruth is doing this primarily for Naomi. Okay, and I'm sure for herself as well to have something to eat. But she's going after the reapers. She's not stealing. Okay, she's going along after the reapers, whatever's been left over. And of course, that takes a lot of scrounging. 
All right, it's not like they were haphazard these reapers and gathering up the harvest. You know, they got what they the most that they could, but then that which was left, uh, she was allowed to take. Then Boaz said to Ruth, "You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women." Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Okay, so Boaz shows favor to her. Okay? He says, I'm going to make special accommodations for you. To make sure, and of course, Naomi's technically family also. And so the fact that Naomi's family, by extension, I'm going to take care of you too. But I think there's something about Ruth that also uh, was interesting as well. But the fact that she observes the fact, why are you taking notice of me since I'm a foreigner? She recognizes the fact that I'm not of your people. You have no reason to show me this type of favor. And so Boaz answered in verse 11 and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you, be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. I think that that statement from Boaz is just a, it's an incredible statement that he makes. That I've heard about all that's happened. And I understand all that you've done for your mother-in-law in in trying to take care of her. You've left everything you've known to come here. But verse 12, I think is is a great statement from Boaz. The Lord repay your work your kindness, your diligence in taking care of your mother-in-law, and full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. What a beautiful statement that he makes there. And this may also contribute a little bit as well to kind of the opening of Ruth's understanding about just what it means to fully trust in Jehovah. Okay, what it means to serve Jehovah, to have that peace that comes in the service of Jehovah. But you see the faith of Boaz and how strong his faith is. And that's also going to rub off, I believe, on Ruth as well. Thoughts or comments through that? All right, we will stop there. And like I said, we're not going to read all of the book of Ruth. At least that's not my intention. Uh, But we will highlight some more next week. And then we'll get to our questions as well. Thanks, everybody.